Lynn Margulis is a renowned biologist whose work has contributed to the increased understanding of the structure and evolution of living cells and inspired new research in other scientific fields. Margulis is the recipient of the coveted National Medal of Science Award. She was interviewed by Jay Tishfield, professor and chair of the Department of Genetics at Rutgers University. welcomes Dr. Lynn Margulis, Distinguished University Professor of Geosciences at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Good afternoon. Hi. How are you? It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure I realize have I have you. a lot of friends here. Oh, I think you have a lot of friends everywhere. <laughs> um, you've had a remarkable career. You're, you're, you're having a remarkable career. Um, you've been elected to the National Academy of Sciences. You're a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. You're one of the three American members of the Russian Academy of Sciences. You've been recognized with the Presidential Medal of Science. Um, how did you start? What interested you in science in the first place when you were a kid? I never believed what they told me. I think that's the crucial thing about mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. I believe what I saw myself. And, uh, well, I was... Um, student, a bad, very bad student in fourth grade or so because I couldn't do what I was supposed to do. And I had to stand in the corner a lot. And my parents took me out of school. This is O'Keefe Elementary School on the south side of Chicago. And uh, they put me into the University of Chicago Laboratory School. That was probably the most fortunate move in my life. And to make a long story short, I ended up in the college at the University of Chicago Laboratory School after spending two years afraid of my life at Hyde Park, Hyde Park High School, sort of typical How urban. How old were you? Well, I was 14 when I went back to there. But I, when I was, see, <laughs> I, anyway, the, the big story is that uh, I walked out of the lab school. I didn't like the boys. I didn't like the people. And registered in the neighborhood school. And after two years in the neighborhood school, which was really the black boy jungle type of situation, I was so glad to get back to the University of Chicago and its rarefied atmosphere. And coming from a more sort of nouveau riche and not... My parents read, but they knew nothing about science at all. Uh, I just found life so interesting. Mm -hmm. And the way that school was run, they can't afford to do it anymore, but the way it was run is that you would meet in September and had classes. None of them were greater than 25 people. Most of them were smaller than that, so there were small classes. And in September, you didn't have to be tested until the next June. June. So each of these classes had nine-hour tests and, or six-hour tests. But this was September, and the tests weren't until June. There were a lot of advisory tests. Classes were not required. That's why I went to the mall. I mean, it was just an amazing intellectual atmosphere. They had squelched football, and they had put out this booklet, so you want an education. Mm -hmm. you know, if you want football, if you want to be popular, if you want to be in sorority, da-da-da, don't come here. But if you want an education, come here. I never even saw it, but I felt it. And I really learned to tell bullshit from... from, re, from Propaganda. I mean, it was very, and from real, authentic experience. And in so, those days, like, didn't they insist that you read all the original sources? Yes, yes. I mean, that was really, I mean, that was one of the few schools that didn't rely on texts yeah, right. and summaries. You had to read all of the original sources. Everything we read, we didn't, we read Isaac Newton. We didn't read it in Latin, but we read it in, in English. But we read the original Newton, and we read Gregor Mendel, and you know about Gregor Mendel, the father of genetics. And we didn't read it in German, but we read the original 32-page dynamic book. And we had a course called NatSci 2, which was officially biologically oriented. Um, NatSci 1 had been chemistry and physics oriented and biology. I mean, NatSci 2, most of it, almost all of it, was no, with no textbook at all. And the question in that course was, what connects generations? I mean, what, uh, how does an egg and sperm become an animal, for mm -hmm. example. And this was, the it was written as a question, what is the material basis of heredity? And you know, without having studied probably particularly, that 
the results of that course and that thinking because James Watson had taken that course a number of years before. Horace, who discovered DNA because he knew what he was looking for, the material basis of heredity. And Horace Friedland Judson, mm -hmm. who wrote The Eighth Day of Creation and the whole history of the molecular biology revolution, had also taken a variation of the course. Both of those people are slightly senior to me. Not, not enough senior, but they are senior to me. And the sense at the time was something really is happening. We're beginning to understand heredity. And I remember Cy Leventhal came and talked. And all the students co came to hear about the relationship to phosphorus to heredity, you know, things like that. So it was a very expiring sort of thing, and I knew no one who knew any science. But, I mean, mm -hmm. you have a, a sharp eye for what you call propaganda. Versus, yeah, well, versus bullshit. truth. That's what they taught us. Yeah, uh, it, but it, uh, it, uh, we said, that's we not unique to science. <laughs> Did you go into science because science has more of that? No, because science was not a question of your political opinion or your orientation. It seemed to me that science was a way of finding out directly about the world from evidence. And uh, I had never seen that in my life. I had only seen people saying, you do that because he said so, or you do that because he knows more than you do. And you know, I was a typical, you know, but I'm sure everybody's subjected to where the arguments are from authority. You read it in the book and it's got to be true because it's in the book. And Jacques wasn't like that at all. And of course, they couldn't sustain that level of uh, indulgence, I would say, to the students. And I found, I mean, I was very young when I went there. I was very glad to get out of the high school, which was a terrifying business. And a lot of my friends played cards and fornicated all day because they just couldn't take that freedom because they had been going to school to bring home, home uh, uh, grade reports to their parents, and I was never that way at all. I was uh, delighted. I had been bored, mm -hmm. and I was never bored again. Yeah. I had been bored, and I didn't know I was bored. I was getting in trouble because I wasn't bored. Sure. But this uh, experience was amazing, and I'm going back to my, you get this, I mean, my 50-year reunion um, in June of this, of, that was of the lab school, not, not the college. And uh, the classmates that I made there, I mean, I still have very big affection. I haven't seen them, most of them, in many years. And, I, st I knew those classmates at the lab sure. school. I had a woman called Bertha Morris Parker, who was our science teacher, and I remember we learned by the experimental method. This is now the lab school, the grade school, where we um, recorded our own observations. And I thought, oh my God, you could find out stuff for yourself. And then, of course, I used to lie in the grass and watch the ants, too. I mean, I was always interested in the natural history. And living on 6920 South Shore Drive, I mean, it's across the street from the... Lake Michigan, but that street, Lake Shore Drive, South Shore Drive, is, uh, it's like the streets out here downtown. I mean, it's just trucks sure. and cars, and it's just to get to the bucolic countryside was a goal. And I don't know why it was, but it just felt right to, to go to the, into nature, always. So you're... And my, my sisters aren't like that at all, so, <laughs> I mean... My parents, my father would be afraid of walking in a forest. Ah, well, you know? So I don't know where I got it. Isn't that the beauty of genetics? Yeah. And the, yeah no two of, of us diversity. are the same. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, yeah, it's, diversity, uh, yeah. it's the best engine of diversity ever yeah. invented. Yeah. So you left Chicago. Uh, you went and took a master's degree, then a PhD at Berkeley. And then you were ready for your first position. Yeah, well, I think it's fair to say, too. When I was 16, going up the stairs in Eckerd Hall, I met this... Uh, tall, handsome, extremely talkative young man who thought that he was going to uh, find life in the universe. And everybody, well, everybody in your generation and my generation knows him, but nobody knows him today because it's been so long. But that was Sagan, Carl Sagan. And uh, he was instrumental in, in the sense that he showed me that people could do science, not just read about it, but actually do it. So I, I, I think that he had a big influence. And, intellectual influence on me and uh, when I was 16 and he was 20 we were on again off again on again off again we finally got married when I was 19 actually so it would be unfair for me to say that I had did this all by myself because he we were never in classes together or anything because he was already a graduate student and of course but he, he was in physics he was in physics he always wanted to be in astronomy. You couldn't be in astronomy without going to the Yerkes Observatory. The Yerkes Observatory, the Yerkes family, I don't know what they made their money in, but they were very generous with it. And they had founded the um, largest 
40 inch at that point mm -hmm. telescope refracting it was before the reflecting I mean, the refract and they put that telescope they said as f uh, no more than 100 miles from the city of Chicago that was a stipulation so it's 99.9 .9 miles I believe in Williams Bay Wisconsin as far away as they could get and that uh, was f the University of Chicago's astronomy department and you have to see a time when planetary astronomy is not taught anywhere I mean it, there were four planetary astronomers in the, in the day and age and I know them all now you know um, and anyway so we ended up there he was a physics student because he had to be a physics student in order to get into the astronomy but his interest was always astronomy physics was secondary so um, your major contribution to science perhaps and though you have many contributions you you're a noted uh, experimentalist you're a noted theoretician but it's perhaps the theory of symbiogenesis the idea that uh, evolution didn't arise slowly through a sequential series of mutations but that arose by adventitious perhaps intimacy of strangers that is uh, organisms coming together in mutually beneficial ways not intentionally of course but in ways that would then provide positive selection material yeah um, this can I rephrase that a little bit please not because you haven't done a nice job but you fall into a f trap that it took me 30 years to get out of no. and that is to use words like mutually beneficial or cost-benefit analysis and so on I, I object violently to that terminology because yeah, I can see we, that. We, we, what we don't want to do is name organisms by the outcome of their relationships which is of course what that is yeah but and, and rather than say um, rather the organisms new organisms novelty evolves mostly not mostly by uh, random mutation I would say or you said not by random mutation I think that's what you said. Yes. I would say that random mutation, of course, does play a large role in, in evolution. But the concept is that random mutation is never enough to go from mm -hmm. one species to another. Right. At random with respect to selection. So random mutation changes in DNA, of course, can be documented. They exist all the time. But what we're saying here, and we have lots of documentation, which I'd love to tell you about, is that when you get something really novel, that is a new species, a new organ, new tissues, new organelles, new features in evolution, it's never by random mutation. If you take a Drosophila and you mutagenize it with a chemical mutagen, an x-rays or something like that, that's, you get a sick Drosophila, you don't get a new species of Drosophila. On the other hand, what's been shown very recently is that if, you, if, you, uh, if some of these insects actually acquire mycoplasmas or other Wolbachia-type bacteria, they can in one fell swoop um, now metabolize new nitrogen compounds. They, uh, in, in just the acquisition and integration of bacteria will change that insect uh, dramatically. So, so there are discontinuities, like you. And of say. course, bacteria is so diverse. So there are so many opportunities. Yeah. My, yes, my favorite example, which is so graphic, um, and maybe Paul Falkowski on this campus is going to invite me back to show this, show this to you, is what we call green animals. These are animals. They're slugs, uh, snails without shells. They're worms. They're completely recognizable. One of them in the film that I'm telling you about, one of them is, belongs to our chordate phylum and it looks like a little tadpole. In all of these cases, the hydra is another one, the coral is another one. In all of these cases, under starvation conditions in the light, you know, they're, they're in the light, they're marine mostly, and they're starving, they eat algae, and usually they digest the algae. But the algae will put up, uh, or cyanobacteria, will put up a fight. And when they put up a fight, they resist digestion and they continue to leak. And the net upshot is that the animal, the f animal's food becomes the animal's body. And in these cases that I w will show, the animals have become completely green. And they r inherit the greenness to all of the offspring. So in any given population of these animals, for example, Convoluta roscafensis, which is on the coast of Brittany and the Channel Islands and now Spain and England, these worms look like seaweed and they fix carbon into photosynthate like seaweed, mm. but you get close, they have muscles, they have mouths, they're completely green and they're photosynthetic. Now they didn't go from a translucent worm 
to a completely photosynthetic worm that lies on the beaches and photosynthesizes as if it were a plant. They didn't do that step by random mutation. They did it by acquisition of a microbial genome and the integration of the genome. That's what we're saying. Uh, that's what and it's saying. always been very difficult for people who study evolution to understand how you can acquire something as dramatic as a flagellum or a cilia or photosynthesis. And I think Where there are many genes, there's right. thousands of genes involved. And, and yes. this gives us a view of evolution that suggests that, if I may use a word here, that evolution is punctate. It is that punctuate. It, it occurs gradually, and then there are great leaps exactly. when this symbiogenesis exactly. occurs, and then it's gradual, and then right. another leap. But I don't want to get more credit than I'm due at that either. There, are, there were um, several. There's a wonderful book by a woman called Khakhina, and she's the second generation of people who've studied this. Laya Nikolaevna Khakhina, and it's called um, uh, Concepts of Symbiogenesis, a Historical Critical Study of the Russian Botanists. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. in the 19th century, Mayershkovsky is the most notable one, Konstantin Sergeyevich Mayershkovsky wrote many papers, like La Plante Commun uh, Communite Scientifique, the plant as a scientific community where he argued that plants, all of them, were the products of symbiogenesis and they had gotten uh, photosynthetic, photosynthesis secondarily. And this stuff was floating around, but it was repressed for at least a generation. And I had teachers who at least had us read, not, not in Russian, but in the English translation, some of these people's work. So I was aware of this, of this work, and they deserve a lot of credit. But the experimental methods weren't there to test it. You're so well known as an educator. Um, you've published numerous books. Um, I think this is one of your more recent books, Acquiring yeah, Genomes. The, um, the, the books have a, a scholarly tack, but there's also a clear emphasis on trying to educate the general public. And I noticed that now that... Uh, this is old, actually. I bought them all back because they were remainder. Well, they're still good. Yeah, of course. They're wonderful. <laughs> Evolution right. doesn't get old quickly. Yeah, right. And uh, you have a, a, actually a coloring book done with uh, your son, Dorian. Right. And um, this is part of your uh, effort to reach out to the general public, improve science education, and also, of course, make people aware of your ideas. Um, do you think, uh, as a woman, um, do you feel that being a woman uh, presented an extraordinarily great challenge for you as a scientist? Do you think it still presents a challenge for women today? Who want to go into I science? can't answer the question for women today because I can't talk about other people's experience with any kind of authenticity. So I would rather avoid that question because I have no answer to it. But I want to say very clearly that I never had a problem as a woman, part, partly probably because although my father later had some sons, in the, my father and mother had four children and all of them, they actually had five, and all of them were daughters, and I was the eldest. So there was no interfamilial double standard because there were no, there were no young boys. And I always loved being around men, and I never had problems being in science classes with mostly men. So I, I, did, I had lots of problems, but the problems were intellectual. That is, people didn't like what I was saying. They didn't like me reading the old stuff. Why? Because you know how science is. If it's at least at MIT library, if any article is older than eight years, it's transferred from science to humanities. Science is considered now. And if it's not now or tomorrow or yesterday, it's not science. And that, all, that was never my attitude. I felt that in order to, and that was probably the Chicago background, in order to really understand a problem like the like the material basis of heredity, you had to know what people had done in the past. Mm -hmm. And you had to know things that were out, out of your field. And so that's where I really had problems. My instructors, for the most part, wanted me to stick to what I was supposed to do, do the homework, do the da-da, and not deviate to other fields. And this became acute when I realized that these phenomena of symbiogenesis in cell origins must have happened at a time and a place on the Earth. And they must have happened before we had trilobites, which are perfectly good arthropod animals. And that's, of course, the beginning of the classical fossil record. So I started to read about the earlier fossil record, and it was amazing. There was a huge amount of work, and let me give you one key. There were people who said that around 2,000 million years ago, the oxygen was in the atmosphere, the soils were already oxidized, and there was no evidence of plants. 
Now, there, were, there wasn't evidence of plants, but there was evidence of cyanobacteria, which of course do absolutely green plant photosynthesis. And at that point, I realized that I had to learn about the Proterozoic Eon, and I had to know what real data was available, rather than say, I'm an evolutionist, and so I only work on... Sure. So, that's what happened. If I were to characterize your work, I'd say that you have a small science laboratory, but that you have really big science ideas and theories. But today, so much of biological science has moved uh, into what we would call big science. Some people say it's like what's happened in physics uh, yes. 30, 40 years ago. you get 30 people on a paper. Exactly, Instead and more. Instead of one or and two. More. More, yeah. um, I find it some of us think that perhaps this is not a good way to train new minds, mm -hmm. even though we may in fact engage in science uh, that's large. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't, I don't participate in the large stuff, and one of the big reasons I changed very happily from a biology department to this wonderful geosciences department at UMass is because you don't have to apologize for your interest in nature. You can't do geology without going outside and studying nature directly. There's no way. And I thought that used to be the case with biologists. There was always a field component in the early days of biology. But now biology has moved into pharmaceutic pharmaceuticals, into hospital mentality. People talk about lower animals and what they're talking about are rats. And they're in the service of uh, the society at large. They get much more money, of course, if they're in that. And the, the naturalists, who I think do a huge service to the quality of life on Earth, the naturalists are marginalized. And they're very often, well, a particular case at UMass is that maybe four or five very fine ones have either died or retired over the last decade, and none of them have been replaced. They've been replaced by NIH cancer type biologists, and is I never for, wanted to. Is that for a lack of suitable replacements? No, there are plenty of suitable replacements. It's because the policy of the chairman and the other people that make decisions is to hire uh, the person who will optimize the rate of cash flow per square foot of university, of university space. We know space. about that very well. I'm sure you do. And I have resisted that, and I'm very happy to resist that. And people say, well, she's not a scientist. She's a philosopher. So it's not as a woman. It's as a philosopher right. that I but get I, I think you're remarkable because um, I noted that your laboratory operates on perhaps $100,000 or $200,000 We've been cut to zero, I want to tell you, in public. Oh. We've been cut to zero because the people who are reading our reviews, well, f because our NASA officer was kicked upstairs to do astrobiology and no longer looked at proposals, right? And he's the one who understood what we were doing. Mm. The two, and the people that are reading the proposals are doing only sequencing, and they don't recognize the names of any of the organisms, and they don't like organismal biology. And so we get terrible grades on peer review, and after 30 years, we're kept to zero. Well, I, I, so, I, I find that horrifying, because when I look at your, uh, your, your history and your productivity, and the number of ideas you've generated with relatively little money. Yes. Uh, I think it was money well invested. Sure. And I think um, I wanted to spend the last few moments talking about your, uh, the, the Gaia theory, which you've been involved with in, in a very fundamental way. I'm wondering if you could explain that a bit to the audience. Sure. The Gaia concept is that the surface of the Earth is regulated and modulated physiologically. That is the temperature of the earth and the acidity and the concentration of gases like oxygen and methane are not here by chance alone. They're here as a product of interaction of the organisms. So what we have been generally as people consider, considering the environment to which life is adapting, the passive, passive life is adapting to, an, to the environment that's changing, is the wrong way to look at it. The way you want to look at it is life is actively changing its environment, and then it is responding to that. But after responding, it's changing it more, right. so that it's not a monologue. But and it's historically, a plants and bacteria have made the greatest contribution to this change. Huge contribution to changes. And if we would obliterate life on Earth as a gedank and as a thought experiment, which we seem to be doing anyway, but if we did obliterate it, the Earth would tend toward a position between Mars and Venus. In other words, we would get very much drier. We would have temperatures that between that we'd get very much more acidic. These are acidic planets. And the reason the Earth is wet and alkaline 
and full of oxygen, in the presence of methane, which reacts with oxygen, the reason the Earth has these surface features is because of the activity of evolving life on the surface. That's basically the idea, but it's Lovelock's idea. You have so much energy, and you seem to be having so much fun. I love I, it. I want to ask science. you just one question about having fun. As long because as it's not I think about science is, <laughs> no. <laughs> I think science is about having fun and attracting I do kids too. to science. I do too. It's showing them that, in fact, it's entertaining. What in your career has been the most fun? Probably this epiphany that chloroplasts have genes and they're, they're membrane-bounded entities, very much like cyanobacteria, established way before me. Mitochondria have genes that are very much like oxygen-respiring bacteria. The genetic system of ciliates, which is too complicated to get into, implied to me that the cilia behavior is just like them, and therefore that also mm -hmm. was of bacterial origin. And once I realized that there was a lot of evidence for that, I just thought, oh my God, and it's now 30 years later, or 40 years later, and I'm still working out the details. And it's much more subtle to work out the details, but I'm convinced that the cell is a microbial community. It's not a bacterium grown large. It's the integration of formerly once separate entities whose free living co-descendants we can still understand. Are you looking toward your students finishing your work? Oh, I don't know. I think I probably will be dead before the people recognize uh, what Wallen, Ivan Wallen, wrote a book, Symbiontism and the Origins of Species in 1927. Wallen said four things in his book. Mitochondria and chloroplasts were of symbiotic origin. Cilia were of symbiotic origin. You'll never understand developmental biology unless you um, look at it as microbial communities as community ecology. That is, developmental biology is community ecology. And the last thing was that all species come by what he called symbioticism. Right. He's dead. Three of the four of his ideas have still not been accepted. Well, I think, I hope your ideas, I think there's a <laughs> long way to go with your ideas. I think we have a lot of understanding of complex organisms. And that understanding will likely come in part, certainly, or in great measure from the bacteria. And you've been such a large contributor to this whole field. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you today. It's a pleasure to be here. Ah, it's fun. Yes, well, <laughs> Rutgers has a Thank lot you of activity very much. going on here, yeah.